Well, welcome to the second semi-final, everybody. So, winner bracket semi-final. Haunted Mines, map number one between Dead Insiders and Disgusting. Another best of five series yet, Meta Mapness. Again, not Meta Madness, the players can still pick whatever hero they want. There are no ban patterns to the heroes that they have to pay attention to. That's going to be happening again when we run the next Meta Madness tournament. But today, it's all about the maps. It's all about Meta Madness. We have Haunted Mines, our starting map for this series. And as I already mentioned in the previous matches, there's only five maps in the map pool. So there's not really a whole lot to go around and that forces the players to go into Black Hearts Bay, to go into Hanamura, to go into Warhead. And it changes things a little bit. We had some pretty entertaining games already. We are now currently in the winner bracket again. Eight teams are participating in the tournament here. There's 900 euros. <clears throat> Oh, hiccups in my throat. 900 euros of prize money. And this is all community driven. So as already mentioned in the past, we have all the Safe Hots initiative. So if you guys want to contribute to that, you can uh, go over to Patreon. If you watch this on YouTube, the link is in the description of the video. If you're on Twitch, exclamation mark Patreon in the chat is going to give you a link there. And as <clears throat> already explained in the past, uh, money there that goes over the threshold will be used for tournaments like this and others in the future since it's pretty difficult to actually get sponsors for Heroes of the Storm tournaments. It's not really a game that a lot of companies are interested in running tournaments in, unfortunately. One of the reasons also why I'm always happy when Hitech, for example, comes in and says like, hey, let's do something once again. So hopefully we can do more with them in the future as well. But now in our semi-final, in our second one, we have with Haunted Mines as the starting map, Brightwing as a first pick. And that doesn't really surprise when you think about it. You have the entire game or the entire map split onto two different levels. You have the mines themselves and Brightwing can always come in and help any hero out there so it's a pretty convenient hero to have if you're trying to make that work especially if you're intending on sending a single hero into the mines on the other hand though we got sylvanas uh, for uh, the blue team and that's kind of interesting because one of the things that you can do on haunted mines and which why it surprised me that sylvanas wasn't taken the last time we saw haunted mines you can ignore the objective completely and instead of going into the mines and trying to go for skulls, you just try and push and take structures down. And that's what a lot of teams have done in the past, and it's one of the main reasons why 100 Mines is actually not in the competitive map pool anymore. There's a couple of other things, of course, as well. Just generally, it's accepted that it doesn't have the best balance. But there's also a lot that has happened since the map was part of a competitive map pool. So there were a lot more heroes introduced since then. That shake things up a little bit. <laughs> Abatha! Now that's sexy. Okay, so we're getting an Abatha here right from the start. Unexpected. But the maps themselves have already forced out a few heroes that I personally didn't expect to see here today. So I'm actually happy that we're going to get Abby now too. Allows you to also make some moves with the mines themselves, of course. So yeah, that's this will be interesting. I still want to know if the players actually practice a little bit for the event here. Yeah. And Uburak and Sonya, because it could very well be that some of the teams were just like, you know what, we're going to play like a couple of scrims. Nothing insane, just a couple of games to uh, see what we can do and uh, what might be a nice move for Blackheart's Bay, for Haunted Mines or whatever. But as it stands, we now have uh, Nuburak and Sonia. We have a triple frontline here, so very melee heavy. And Karazim comes in. This is, of course, a perfect support when you're playing with Abathar. It makes him even more punchy. Pun intended. Haunted Mines, map number one. Best of five series here, ladies and gentlemen. Let's jump straight in. Uh, the first game between Dead Insiders and Disgusting. Haunted Mines, game number one. Dead Insiders against Disgusting. On the left side, Shizakid with Johanna. We have bishops on Blaze, Limu playing Karazim, anime power on Sylvanas. Uh, we got no game, no life on Abathar. And I can absolutely uh, just like emphasize anime power here as well. Right now, there's so many good shows out there. It's actually insane. Demon Slayer, great. We have Blue Lock now. Awashi is also insane if you're looking for a football anime that is a little bit more family friendly than uh, what Blue Lock brings across. But yeah, that's definitely a lot of good shows that are currently running. So good time for anime fans. Either way, Lavakal on the right side of the map playing for Disgusting. He's a rocking Brightwing. We got Akunas on Urel. 
Alvarus playing Hanzo for the team. Mimikyu with Nuburak. And Itrax on Sonya. So I really want to see, first of all, two heroes and what kind of impact they have in this game right now. So Anime Power on Sylvanas and No Game No Life on Abatha. Both of them are pretty interesting here. And they could have a huge impact, especially if the blue team decides to be a bit more aggressive with the way that they are pushing around the objective or yeah, how they're playing it just in general with the golem and with the skulls and the mines, if they're really focusing on it or if they're just saying, you know what, we don't really care, we're just going to use Sylvanas and try to be aggressive with her. So definitely a couple of decisions that need to be made by the teams. And we'll figure that out pretty quickly once that the mines open up. Abatha. I love Abatha. Good Abatha player is always fun. It's definitely one of those heroes that you love to see in, on a competitive level. We got Urel at the top taking to the solo lane. Obviously, 100 Mines is a very small map. And I said that also in one of the previous series, but this is where I casted the longest game that I think is on my YouTube channel. So an absolute crazy game that was played. I want to say it was in the first year of Heroes of the Storm. And it had, I believe, 100 kills and was 60 minutes long. So absolutely mind-blowing. Not top-level play, don't get me wrong, but highly entertaining, as the kill count alone is probably already suggesting. But the teams were absolutely incapable of ending, and it was just funny as hell. But yeah, that's still hidden somewhere on the YouTube channel. And what's also hidden is, well, Urel right now, because she is a dead. So, Urel down. Easily eliminated here, and that's first blood for dead insiders. Every time I read that nickname, it reminds me a little bit of the in-betweeners. So, I don't think that... Oh, ho, 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 baby! What a jet propulsion! Damn, that's a double! They are able to get a double kill out of this, and it looked for a second like they are able to lock in a triple kill. That was some sexy play here. Check this one out. What a hit! A condemn into a jet propulsion. And now we're looking at three kills to zero in this first game of the best of five. That is pretty impressive the way that they just uh, played that out. So, well, can they capitalize on it? That's the question. Early on in the game, usually uh, you have to be a little more careful because with Abatha in the mix, you don't have to copy it. That ticks in on level 10. That means you can body soak, of course, to an extent, but you're also vulnerable because in team fights, you don't have that additional hit point bar that Abyssa brings, or the copy brings with it, or an additional hero. So yeah, that was pretty, pretty good for the blue team. Taking a lead like this with this comp is great. I mean, this comp is going to get a huge power spike in level 10, as do all the teams, obviously, but with Abyssa in the mix, this is even more so true. This fight, not that great for them. Five versus four, again, Abyssa, yes, he can help out with the damage, but when it comes to sustain, he is definitely going to have to take a little bit of a yeah, step back. So they have to give up the, the camp. That was more or less expected and inevitable. Abyssa diving out, and they kind of baited an Uber rocket and they get a kill. Maybe Disgusting is currently a bit too eager to make up for those early deaths, so now they are losing even more heroes. Trying to turn it again, and this time they are able to take Karazim out, but I guess Sonya is eventually still gonna die, right? Yeah. Abatha helping, and that is at the end of the frontliner. So, the mines are up. Nobody making a move just yet, and this is where we really have to... Okay, so Joe... No, no. Well, they're, they're just going for the push. So nobody... Oh, actually, we got Urel going for the mines. She is actually really strong to, to get some of those. Can with a couple of... Well, comes easily get those skulls together, which is exactly what we're seeing from Akunis. But as expected, after the Sylvanas pick, they don't care. They just go and push, and they just do structural damage, and they're like, yeah, what you gonna do? If you get a big golem at the beginning, first of all, in the early game, it doesn't scale you too well. And then second of all, even if you get the better and the stronger golem here, as long as we do some structural damage beforehand, it's gonna be fine. It's a bit of a meme that Karazim is the one that actually goes in and starts to take those down. I guess Abatha can help out a little bit, but that's still strange. We already have 50 skulls in the hands of Disgusting. But I would have expected Sylvanas to stay at the top and just do her thing. Instead, we're now having Jojo move down. Apparently, they really want to fight for this. I'm honestly really surprised. And they screwed it up massively. 
Sylvanas with a bit of a Sudoku move as she stayed and then tried to go back down. So now Nuborak is creating a bit more space for them, but that's going to be a huge golem for Disgusting. Now, how much of a role does that really play? That's a question to be answered a bit later. Normally the first objective is not that powerful, just doesn't scale well enough. But we have the move through the top lane now, as at least Shizakid is hoping to take a few of the structures down. With success, by the way, he takes the tower and the gate down. Both teams with level 7, which also gives us Mule. And they are taking a big, big all in here. 87 skulls already, the final 10 are coming in. And that puts them to 97. Now, Sylvanas has helped to do damage. The problem that they experience is simply that it probably wasn't enough. Unless, of course, they can get the kill. And indeed, they do. Sonya is down. Can they get more? That's the big question. Yeah, Nuborak. And Nuborak is dead. Sonya is dead. Oh, boy. Yeah, that hurts. Look at that fort alone. The fort is nearly dropped. Limu, she's like, hit. somebody is likely to fall. And the fort is still standing. But it's still the same result here. The mule, the mana mule gets dropped. <laughs> They're dropping the mana mule on them. Oh, the stack of two throwbacks. And now we have the bot lane getting attacked. I mean, even that fort has already see, also seen better days. And I guess the golem is going to take it down. Or at least has a shot of doing that. Up here at the top, they still have to stop this. But since it's the first one in the game, they are very, very likely going to be successful on that. So, yeah. Ah, Ford actually is defended. Nice. But yeah, still a little bit of experience. Top lane Golem is a lot doing a lot more work, but structurally, dead insiders are still ahead. Yeah, still pretty good. So right now, we have the push with the jet propulsion. They're starting diving a bit deeper, obviously utilizing Karazim too. In this case, anime power is being helped out, but Sylvanas is now in real trouble. Nice dodge on the stun, though. And she is actually able to get out and baits him into the jet propulsion. Ah, Brightwing to the rescue, but that got dicey very quickly. It could have been a huge problem. And they're keeping everybody alive here, but the blue team in the last few encounters was very much so on the run here. Fairly even experience, but structurally, yeah. I mean, again, it hasn't really been of any consequence yet. But all of these are kind of low. Now, there's obviously also the mule still to consider. And in this case, Urel jumped in to take him down quickly. That's a kill, by the way. Oh, well, the shield might just be enough. Abathur is still there. Yeah, and he goes down. Karazim with Abathur support is just insane. So annoying. Talking about Abathur. No game, no life. At the bottom of the map has to be a bit careful since Sonya was starting to get a bit aggressive. Is she going leap? Are they going full aggressive on her? With her holding back her ult, it seems uh, to be a little bit more likely that she... Nah, okay. Breath of the Berserker. Not memeing around. But there's the double Sylvanas play now. No game, no life. Jumping in. Trying to stay alive on the copy a little bit longer. And is able to do that. So gets more and more value out of the hero. Wow. That was impressive. I thought they were able to burn the copy down super quickly and deny value. But nope. He stayed alive way, way longer than he should have. And I was able to massively contribute to the kill on Sonya. Nine kills to three. In team fights, they're doing fantastic. Dead insiders with some dead on plays here. They're coming through the top lane now with Siege Giants, whereas Abatha is still holding the experience down at the bottom of the map and is attempting to stop those Siege Giants that were sent on route a bit earlier. And next undead set is spawning in 10 seconds. Now we're talking about the next golem here too. But, yep. There you go. Ooh. Spray game. Not on point. Very disappointing here by Limu. That's not what I want to see here. So, yeah. That was a bit of a... Uh, yeah. That's an F. That's an F right there. I can't really reward that with anything more. I mean, you didn't even try. Come on, bro. Like, yeah. So, down at the bottom of the map, they are going for the camps again. And they're trying to escort them out uh, as well as they can. But, once more, it is a move for the pumpkins. And for a potential kill on Karazim, who barely sneaks his way out of the fight, drops the seven-sided to save himself a little more time. And Nuburak, and Nuburak, don't tell me he survives this. All right, he gets killed, but they gotta give up the camp, as it seems. Limu is le lower than 30 HP, so he barely made it out. Still not taken. They're turning it again with the Velo Jet propulsion. What the hell is going on here? The blue team. They grab it, and the red team is on the run. 
It's actually insane how back and forth that game is. But there is of course one team that is slowly and steadily starting to pull a bit more ahead and that is Dead Insiders. They now have a one and a half level lead, they have a talent advantage and they have destroyed both of the forts of their opponent. Abatha getting in position, Blaze is starting to make a move for the mines now and uh, together with Karazim uh, and Sylvanas, three of them entering the mines and Abatha of course helping out too, they're trying to get the lead here. For the same reason that Brightwing is really solid on the map, Abatha of course is a very good choice here too, it doesn't matter if you're at the top or at the top level or in the mines, he can always help out and also Soak experience still, so Abatha really really a good choice here if you are able to go through a good early game. And both of the teams very much so looking for that strong golem. Uh, can she? Okay, Anubrug is here. You still need to defeat the middle. All comes down to the team fight and another stun chain against Sonya. And she gets dropped eventually I want to say, but the spin to win keeps her alive and everybody is low, has to enter the bunker. Yeah, Brightwing is low too, but oh my god, a triple kill against the blue team is what then eventually happens. That went from, hey, everything is hunky-dory to, oh shit, we're dying. Yeah, they were looking great at the beginning, and then they just get absolutely wrecked. I mean, in the bunker, they were so low already, and the red team just swamped them. Sonya not dying was a huge problem, and even Brightwing surviving here then led to that massive engage and the triple kill. Now, it's 62 to 38 skulls on the golem, so yeah, they're still both pretty... I mean... Yeah. Red team has a bit of an edge, but is it worth it? Is it that much more? I don't think so, especially when you consider that now Siege Shines are uh, being sent out on both lanes and Nubora gets blown up by another seven-sided here, so that even further limits the options of Disgusting with that objective. Can be an easy defense if the blue team wants it. They are still ahead in experience. They're not even making a play here, instead they are just uh, smelling blood in the water. Yeah, very, very nice arrow here from Hanzo. That at least stops them cold for a second. Urel is now starting to move in too, but it doesn't change the outcome, at least for now, because Blaze is in trouble. Sonya is dead. Sonya down, and now with Sylvanas, with the Siege Shine Cam, catapults, and then on top of that also the Golem. There's no way they're gonna hold that keep. There's absolutely no way. This just isn't happening. 40,000 damage by Sylvanas at this point in time. That bot lane golem might do some damage, but even if it takes down the fort, that's still a worthy trade for the blue teams. So they're going to be very happy with this. They might even be able to snowball this a little bit further towards the core if this continues. They're all low though, so it's unlikely, but yeah, crazy stuff. Ooh! Oh! Oh! No! No! Abatha! Not like this! Oh boy! I mean, it would be pretty embarrassing if we would play that again for the playout. So I guess we're gonna do it, but boy oh boy. Everything looked good at first, and then down at the bottom of the map, get rooted bitch, and BAM! There's a stun and a kill. That is a sad moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Abatha, he got caught a little bit. I mean, if the heroes can't do it, then the golem will, you know? That's just what it is. 13 to 7. There we go. And, well, we have the level 16 advantage still, of course. There is still that lead. But maybe now a bit of a chance? It's a little weird thing to say, because there's one keep already destroyed. Disgusting obviously needs to get kills now. I mean, they obviously need to come in and get a big team fight, get some kills and maybe after the team, like, if they can time it properly and maybe force the early fight in the mines, for example, and then turn around, get the skulls, get the better golem and then gain some momentum in the game that would maybe help them here, but it's going to be a big ask. They really need to push this now. It's the only thing that they can possibly do. I mean, either way, we're having them in a spot where they can still defend. Brightwing could also hold to the top lane a little bit longer. The one thing that can't happen is them losing a hero now. Jet Propulsion connects. And yeah, Yurel, there's the silence. And she's dead. This is exactly what can't happen. The arrow through the entire team. Brightwing dies too. 
and that's a huge problem. I mean, they pretty much just lost everything now. This was their ticket back into the game. They still don't have level 16. It seems like even more of their heroes are going to get murdered here. Alvaros is barely getting out. The cocoon got dropped. They move past the keep with Sylvanas. They should be able to take that down too. And Mana Mule gets dropped again. Mana Mule in the house and things are just looking very tricky for Disgusting. I mean, dead insiders, they won't be able to end the game here, but they have full control now. There's a massive wave accumulating up at the top, including by now three catapults, and Abatha is helping that out as best as he can. So somebody will have to deal with it, which gives the blue team even more time in the mines to go for the next golem. Huge problem now. So yeah, they're starting to make their move 15 to 7. It's actually the red team that goes into the mines first. The blue team instead is making plays for the pumpkins here. But there's catapults going for the core in just a second. And the red team is currently not defending that at all. And there's a camp coming up, as I already mentioned. I guess they're attempting to maybe trap a little bit. No, not either. So they go for camps. They stay top. They just stay top and do their thing here. Brightwing now had to move back because there's two catapults in the core. And that's just a bit too much for comfort. So they are 15 minutes in, and Brightwing had to deal with it. Shield is still rather low, but they're going for another fight. They get Hanzo. They're trying for a double kill, but Inuborak escapes. The rest of the team is not safe yet, though. And another jet propulsion is just a bit too much for them to handle. Down goes Sonya. Bit of hoppity hop by Urel. Seven-sided even being used. They're chasing her down, too. She doesn't have anything left here. And that is another kill. The space goat gets murdered. And the same I drew for Brightwing. So the cocoon gets uh, launched again. There's still the camp at the top lane that is slowly starting to pressure towards the core. The keep at the bottom of the map is definitely going to fall. And this is not looking any better. You got catapults against you. You got siege giants against you. At least Johanna got killed. But it looks like Anubarak is not going to make it. And neither does Brightwing. 73% on the core. So they're going to lose everything here. 20 isn't even in their hands just yet. But that would drop in a few seconds as well. 20 kills to 8. And the 1-0 lead for Dead Insiders. Against Disgusting. A GG. Well played. The blue team taking the lead. Before we head into game number two, make sure that you subscribe to the channel if you haven't done it yet so you don't miss out on any future content here on Calder TV. Game number two, Braxis Holdout. The blue team has taken the lead and now we're heading into Braxis Holdout. So, again, five maps in the pool. Braxis, Haunted Mines, Hanamura, Warhead and Blackheart Bay. So... We're going to get at least one more map after this one. Uh, but yeah, this is best of five, obviously. And let's check this out a little bit and see if the red team can come back here. I got to say that Dead Inside has played this very clean on the last map. Abertha had a huge impact in a lot of the team fights. They were very aggressive, as you would expect from them as a team. And yeah, the red team, they had their moments, but... <laughs> I mean, it started all with a triple jet propulsion at the top lane, where they lost two heroes super quickly. The one thing that was a little bit memey was, of course, when Abatha died. I mean, poor slugger. He was just, like, sitting there minding his own business, and then all of a sudden that golem just comes along and drops him. Uh, so, yeah, that was, that was kind of funny. I assume that he wanted to just, like, waddle away, and then all of a sudden you get rooted, and then there's the follow-up stun, too. So, yeah, it's kind of... It's kind of crazy. But alright, now we get uh, at least the ban on Sachin Hammer. Chromie, so any kind of like big range damage is banned out against Disgusting. They don't want to deal with that. Braxis, I, I mean, now that he's not banned, I would say that Genji is very likely going to be picked in the first rotation. Yeah, there he is. Especially since Limo is on the team, are you kidding me? And the next thing that I would ask myself is like, what's happening with Andon right now? Does the red team pick him away? Or do they just accept that a light bomb Genji is possible? Could be alright with it, but that would hurt, I would assume. So yeah, Anduin and Genji as a combo, pretty powerful. Brightwing and Urel get taken, so uh, Brightwing obviously is adding a lot here and can also be used a little bit as a counterplay to Genji to an extent. The CC is always nice. Question is, do they want to go for the light bomb? Yes or no? Mm. Yeah, and we'll see. I mean, 
generally you want to have mobility too if you want to go for a dive composition again they could also think about a new Burak to add him uh, to this as well Rexa for the top lane and there's Anduin all right so they already got their top laner they have the Anduin and Genji combo they went for it and that leaves us still with a couple of Mirrodin can traverse terrain pretty easily and Nubura can of course be played in the same spot as well we still need a couple of damage dealers here Hanzo is someone that has a certain mobility that he can also bring to the table so he's another option and Sylvanas would of course also be pretty sweet already saw her with a huge impact on the first in the first game but you can do even more here if you are pushing with the Zerg wave for example so yeah, frontliners are definitely going to be interesting. Nubar, uh, Ruck and Murden, as I said, are definitely options. If you want to have that mobility that allows you to traverse between the lanes very quickly. But let's see what they're going to go for. I mean, there's obviously also a couple of more stationaries, not quite as... Uh, yeah, Diablo. Not quite as um, flexible frontliners that can really pack a punch, and he's one of them. Cassia for a bit of range and we saw Cassia actually a few times already in the tournament so at least here making a little bit of a comeback but the final double pick is now happening for uh, the blue team she's a kid and anime power we still need we, we need more damage and we need a main tank those are pretty much the two requirements could go also into a triple melee at the front line if you wanted to but they go for Suljin and they got Tyrael all right Tyrael offers the mobility too final pick Alvaros What's he gonna put to bring to the table here? Still need somebody for the four man. Always assuming that they're going to uh, establish the one versus one at the top lane with Ural and Rexa. Genji is a pain. He's gonna be a real pain for Ural in particular. So yeah, the one in one lane it's going to be very very annoying. But yeah, final pick. It's my F. Okay, so they can definitely force a couple of fights. Also, Suljin, how much of an impact is he going to have? How well can he stack here? That's the next question. But either way, let's jump in. Braxis, hold out everybody. Map number two in this series. Game number two. On the left, we got Shizakit on Tyrael, Limon, Genji, Anime Power on Anduin, Bishops on Rexa, and no game, no life is playing Suljin. Get those stacks together. He's not the only one that's stacking. So is Cassia. Once again, we got Lavacal playing her. Itrax is on Diablo. Alvaros on Brightwing. Akun is on Urel. And Mimikyu is playing Maiev. So a little bit of role swapping compared to some of the previous games that we've seen from the team here as well. At the bottom of the map, as you would expect, the four mans are colliding. And top side. Ah, well, actually not quite yet because Genji was hiding a little bit, so he's at the top. So they're making this a 2-3 split for now. Genji is going to be the one that will rotate over uh, between the lanes very heavily. But Rexa alone should be able to handle Ural at the top. Rexa on any game or on any map where you have to control two points at the same time, Rexa is actually extremely good and will eventually win that battle. Doesn't mean that he necessarily gets the kill against the opponent, but you can hold the lane. And together with Misha, that's definitely something he can pull off. They're trying to pressure though, so Urel has to retreat and they're damaging the top wall. But the same is also true as you can see here down at the bottom of the map, where Disgusting has a 4 to 3 advantage in numbers that they're attempting to exploit. Level 1, we're getting the recklessness here right away for Suljin. And we will definitely have a bit of a look at that baseline. You should be able to complete that very, very quickly. And that helps a lot with the stacking. And he's crushing it already. He's at seven stacks and really bringing the pain. Oh, and he, ah, he goes down. For a moment, it looked like he might just make it, but no. And now, look at that momentum swing. Damn, the entire wall destroyed. Whereas at the top, the only thing that was taken out is a single tower. So the red team incredibly aggressive right now and for good reason they're really playing their cards well here and i like the way that they are opening up the bot lane very early in the game so that definitely allows for some aggressive plays to be made if they are trying to dive here a little bit at the top we still have the control over one of the beacons now the red team uh, has the bottom beacon firmly in their hand 
So the fight's still continuing, and obviously every single skirmish, every single battle, every single fight is playing into the hands of Suljin. If no game, no life is able to stack this into a potential late game, then he is going to absolutely crush. This is why he's one of the primary targets now for Disgusting as well. Uh, pro tip, a dead Suljin cannot stack. So, yeah. <laughs> but this one is very much so alive and they're getting a kill on Diablo because yes that rotation that I talked about earlier is now happening. Genji moved in and it immediately resulted in two heroes falling. Diablo and Cassia both dead and Suljin on 12 stacks already whereas the top wall got destroyed by Rexa and Misha and now we have even double control on the beacons from the blue team. They are looking very very strong right now. This is a great spot for them to be in as you can imagine because now they have so many things going for themselves they are already at 50 percent this is not a winner takes all objective so even if the red team is able to turn it those 54 percent are locked yeah suljin still having some trouble here though like he, he gets caught that's a problem so he's stacking massively and he's still alive he still got out of this one it's kind of bonkers. Needs to stay away from the walls though or Diablo is going to come in and punish him. But he's getting so close to the 15 stacks that he needs for the first quest reward that it's a bit worrisome for the red team. Once that he has the increase in range, it's going to be so much easier for him to get those stacks without dying. Top fort has already been attacked and damaged. Bottom fort, not yet. They weren't able to open the wall up, obviously. They were playing a 4 versus 3 the entire time. But the red team doing very well here. But Disgusting is trying to bring this back. And they are doing damage at the bot lane. And if they can drop that 4, that would be a fantastic step into the right direction. But here comes Suljin once again. There's the range increase for him now. And he's just chunking them down. Jesus, he's turning the frontliners into minced meat right now. Coming in, one axe after another. 18 stacks already. He's not even on level 7 yet. He's already starting to slowly close in on the second quest reward. So yeah, that's definitely a bit of a concern. Atrex comes in and tries to get his hands on him, but that's not working either. The top lane is still pressured by the double that is aiming to take the fort down. So even if both of the teams lose the forts, free stacking for Suljin all day, every way. Good tether though. They want no game, no life. And and uh, he makes it again. Now, to be fair, he's probably is going to die another time or two. But yeah, ooh, you rel dead. That's a problem. Now, he died as well. So at least Genji died. But it means that the top fort gets now destroyed. Down at the bottom of the map, they are also pushing past the fort, which results in it getting murdered. But now we have the Arcanite Axis in play, and we're already at 21 stacks for Suljin. 24, by the way, only for Cassia at the 5-minute mark. So, yeah. Structurally, they're trading. But the late-game potential of Suljin is pretty incredible. Now, Cassia, of course, is also scaling as she gets stacks on her level 1. But Suljin is just not... Yeah, he, just, Suljin is going to be a monster. If this continues at pace, Suljin is going to murder this. And the problem that they're also facing is that time and time again, the blue team regains control of this. Even another second bot, maybe with his life, that is not looking good for him. Yeah, he's trying to get back at Limu. He's going to die. There's no way he's going to get the swift strike back in time. But he bought a bit more time for the team. They're at 84% now. They stole the camp away. So there's that. And yeah, the fights continue. Four versus five in a moment. Diablo again being used as a pin cushion with Suljin throwing out those needles. 23. The level one is obviously helping him massively with all of this, but now they're down. To, he's at 26. They even get the kill. They even get the bloody kill, and Anduin saves Suljin as Diablo was threatening to kill him. So 26. Finally, he dies. He's at 26 stacks, but finally he's dead. While all of this is happening, we have, by the way, this going on over here. So this is taking the wall down. Things are really not working together for Disgusting. They're finally getting some kills. They're actually ahead in kills. They're ahead in kills and they're ahead in experience. So technically you'd think that they would be pretty happy with the position they're in, but I don't really think so. There's a bit of a pressure play at the bottom of the map, so similar situations unfolding here too. 
But yeah, this is definitely a bit worse what's happening right here. Especially with a 100% Zerg wave that just got locked in by Dead Insiders. We only have 18% for Disgusting. So yeah, we are gonna get a very, very brutal push through the top now. Level 10 is early for Disgusting on the other hand. Can they force it before the blue team catches up? Suljin is at the bottom of the map. Him missing is annoying. He's now moving topside. He's trying to help them out here. Yeah. Apocalypse is being used. Everybody has their ult. Sanctification, yes. There's also the light bomb combo for Genji. That's gonna be huge. Suljin, for the love of God, please pick the right talent. Light bomb, one stun. And he goes for Guillotine. No! <laughs> Why would you go for one shot potentially here? What? I mean, the safe play... How did that miss? What? The fuck was that? The safe play would have definitely been to go for, uh, for his unkillable. I mean, that was a little bit bonkers, honestly. Yes, if you get a light bomb engage with Genji and you get the stun, then he can come in with a guillotine. But if you want to make it very easy for yourself in the late game, then this is the wrong choice. I mean, you're already stacking out of your mind. Can you imagine how much damage he can do later? What happens when he is level 20? I mean, even before that. So, not so sure on this. The one thing that can be done by Disgusting to keep Soldier in this check is killing him. And they made it now much easier. So, yeah, they're going in set for Rexa first. Suljin still firing away, 28, uh, gets the guillotine out, the hit is there, but it doesn't result in anything major, 29 stacks, and there's going to be the 30 in just a second, so he has the double swing on the Arcanite Axis now, there we have it, 23 by the way on the Axis, so even that is already a lot, and now he's just absolutely crushing Diablo too. Where's the damage output for our boy? He's currently sitting at 33,000, a little bit behind my F, who is top dog in the game. But I think this is now going to change very, very quickly. So, yeah. Unnecessary risk to take your team. With a good light bomb engage from Genji, they can get a kill. But I'm not sure why you would do that. It's in my eyes an unnecessary risk. The safer play would have been to just bank for, yeah, for normal play. Worst case, you have to go into the late game. I don't think that they are afraid of that at all. They're definitely scaling much better. So, well, as it is, we already have him on uh, 31, not even 10 minutes into the game. Beacons are popping up again. Yeah, Light Bowman Gage gets dodged and so does the Guillotine. So the combo already doesn't work, which means that you're using two ults and you're not getting anything out of it. So, in a situation like that, if anybody is able to dodge it, if anybody is jumping out, then two ult cooldowns have been used for absolutely nothing. But he's still able to use that wall to use the rest of the team as a buffer and cover for all of the auto attacks that he's still chunking out. So yeah, they're getting a lot here. Beautiful sanctification to us. They're driving the fight way into the heart of the opponent's team. But everybody's low. Both teams are very low in HP. But Genji is the one that is starting the clean house with a quick switch strike kill against Cassia. Was aiming for the second one against Urel, but couldn't quite get that. Now, yeah, another guillotine. Oh, the jump a little bit too late. Well done, though. Really, really nice move here towards the end. So Suljin with value. A little bit mistimed by my F, or she might have been able to dodge that. But now, of course, they are in a great spot. I mean, right here, look at this one. The hit connects, it's a bit too late, then it's a kill. Diablo gets uh, dropped a second later. Eight kills to six in total. They are able to get the boss now. So that one has been locked in successfully. And they also have, through all of this, a double control on the beacon, which allows them to work towards the next objective and pressure the lanes even further. Suljin is by now on 43 stacks on his baseline, 39 on his level 7. And that results at the 11 minute mark with him at 49,000 damage. Keep in mind, just a couple of seconds ago, one teamfight ago, he was way behind my F. And in that little time frame, he, I think, got around 18,000 damage. Insanity. Absolute insanity. So, he is totally crushing it here. Supported by the rest of the team, of course. But now, a desperate attempt by Disgusting to get objective control back. Which is so far also a little bit of a tall order. The top lane is pushing for keep. 
over here they're trying to steal the camp away even that is not necessarily working apocalypse being used good stun suljin affected as well misha about to go down suljin still stacking getting more and more hits in and he is just murdering with that auto attack damage ruel doesn't even know what hits her i mean she knows a couple of axes are hitting her hard but yeah <laughs> no she's not here <laughs> Ah, guillotine. Genji is actually dead, so the red team, the red team is making them pay for it. The red team is doing their thing. Suljin is still hitting some very nice uh, level sevens, but he's also at nearly 50 stacks now on that baseline. So these auto attacks are a huge problem now. And look at Diablo. Diablo is getting melted away by him. These axes are going through Diablo like hot butter through cheese. One after another is hitting home and his hit point pool is just melting away. Like ice cream in the sun. So massive problems now for them. 80 stacks for Cassia. So she's also doing her best to stack it up and she's at 55,000. We're talking about Suljin a lot but she's also bringing the pain. She definitely does. The hits are coming and Suljin with a double kill. Damn, that was a good ult by him. Gets the connect, drops Maiev, drops Cassia, and then they follow up with the Genji kill on Urel. Suljin still... One hit after another. He's sitting at 67,000 damage. Anduin with the double pull now in level 16. And the objective, the Zerg wave, already moving through the bot lane. Genji coming in here to take the keep that has taken significant damage already previously. And they are moving for the core. And so they should. They got Suljin and the more important part is they got Sanctification. So if they play this right, they got the Sank here. They Sank it up on Suljin to keep him alive. But this little move by Diablo at least forces them to retreat and not go and end the game. So really nice defense by Diablo on that encounter. That combo that he unleashed with the Apocalypse was absolutely spot on. If that doesn't hit properly, then they might lose the game right here. But as it stands, they have still a fighting chance because they're back on the map with five. They're still a talent down, so that makes it tricky. But they can still fight for this. So well done by Disgusting. They're still in the game, but there's the Light Bomb engage, and it hits hard. And so does the guillotine. Oh boy, 14 to 8 kills. And yeah, Suljin, 57 stacks on his level 1. And he is just pulling away from Cassia. 74,000 damage at this point in time. And they kill the keep. So both of the keeps are now down. Both of the keeps are gone. And with that, we are now, yeah, moving in once again for another little move here on the boss pot potentially, once that it's up again. And final four seconds, so yeah, there we are. But all right, let's see what they can actually do with all of this. We have uh, still half a level until 16 is there, so potential defense is in the cards. Question is just always, can they do that or not? And then what they have to do is they have to engage around the boss that is now being taken by dead insiders. And unfortunately for them, that's being forced before level 16 is there. But maybe a kill here? Oh my god, he got bullied around. Still alive though. Suljin is dead. Yeah, and that's a problem. Suljin down is definitely a problem for them. But we now have the top lane. Look at this. Genji could move in together with it. And I think that's exactly what Limo is going to try and do. So they get the boss. They steal it away. Brightwing moves back. But now everybody else has to hearth as well. So he's trying to get them a little bit closer. Then catapults do work. But I don't think he can pull that off. He's forcing them to get back to base though. And as long as he can escape here, it's going to be totally fine. Sanctification again employed by Tyrael to save him and his bros. But we have the camps claimed. The boss doing damage at the top. So there's a bit of a ticket back into the game situation going on right now. That could very well result in them maybe even dropping a keep. But the lanes are still pressured and Suljin is back now. So Suljin is back and that should make this defense a lot easier. But the top keep might still fall. So yeah, the stuns are already in and Diablo, I feel at this point a little bit sorry for him. Brightwing dies too, but I don't feel sorry for her. The fruit fly can die however often she wants. That's exactly what she deserves. Genji is dead, so they're at least going for a couple of counter kills. And Anduin! He saves Suljin for another hit. 
allows them to take Urel down, but eventually the troll dies. Lavakal also a bit low. He should fall here. It's at 101 stacks for Cassia now. The keep is still there. The keep is still there. So, yep, well done. We now have 18 to 12 on the kill count, <laughs> which is in and of itself nuts. Again, two kills per minute, roughly. Triple Catapult is now moving in. Uh, not going to do a whole lot of damage, considering that they're going to be back in time. Yeah, Diablo with the Apocalypse here is trying to make a play for Rexa, who feigns his death, the worst act in the universe. Finally able to use that for, uh, for good. But, uh, well, with Brightwing coming in, that's a kill. Yeah. Uh, backfired a little bit. They thought they could turn it on Diablo, but not so much. Brightwing is saying hello real quickly. And it also threatened Tyrael's life, so now they, are, have, they have to deal with a staggered death. This game is getting, getting a little bit wild all of a sudden. I mean, this game is getting really wild right now, because this was more or less a locked victory for Dead Insiders. They had this. This was all said and done. And now, the blue team is falling apart? They're falling apart here. Like, the disc? Is he getting away? No, he dies! Another staggered death! Like, what are they doing? They're falling completely apart. They're losing all cohesion here. This is a disaster for them. They're trying to prevent the objective. Suljin moved back, but they're gonna retake this now. So level 20, yes, they'll have it. But the problem is still the same. It's a 5 versus 3 on the map. The lanes might be pushing, but this is going to be a big Zerg wave, and they are way too far out. What is Anduin doing there? Why would you go there in the first place? He gets tethered. Get the hell out of there. Yeah, in comes the level 20. They have everything, and ooh, Sanjin completed for Genji. Yeah, that could be a problem. That could definitely become a problem. They still are missing Genji. The Zerg wave has been unleashed. 18 kills to 14. This is, this is a wild one. Yeah, Suljin, he's at 83, 84 stacks on his level 7. 93,000 damage. He's soon going to enter the 6-digit club. Urel is at the back, by the way. She had to defend. Urel had to defend, and now both teams are on level 20. So even if you have to sacrifice the keep here, it's still all right. But it's a 5 versus 4, too. Diablo went into the Lord of Terror. Completely missed the apocalypse here. Misha is at least dead, but the hits keep coming, and Brightwing gets nearly one shot by the Arcanite Axis. So Brightwing is insanely low, gets absolutely crushed here, but so does the keep. So the keep is gone, and even without Ural, it seems like they're thinking about making a play for the core here. Yeah, Light Bomb once again, trying to move back, and Diablo is down. He had the soul stack. Genji is also dead, so it's a kill for a kill. But it's again Suljin who absolutely crushes it. By now, he has 100 stacks on the Arcanite Axis. They're getting the kill on Cassia, and now they are trying to make the play also for Malefit. They get her barely. Suljin did not look good there for just a moment. Brightwing gets out, but where does that leave us? The core didn't take any damage here. Catapult against Catapult. They now, 20 minutes into the game, are looking at 36 kills in total. And what is the blue team now going to do? It's a 4 versus 3 on the map, and it seems like they're going to go for camps. Take the camps first. Can they go for the boss? They might just be able to pull it off, honestly. With Genji back in 18 seconds, that's much sooner than anybody else on the, uh, on the other side. So they could try to go for the boss here too. Suljin is at 107 stacks on his level 7. It's insane. Like, his damage is a nightmare for any frontliner right now. There's the stun on Ural. She's dead. She's dead. She's dead. She's dead. She, this it has to be a kill. Where is Genji when you need him? Dead, of course. She survived through it. Genji wasn't there. Totally blanking on that. But, uh, yep. He's back to business now. And they're trying to come back in for it. 120,000 damage for Suljin. 120,000! That's insane! Tyrael needs mana, so they move back, but they couldn't get anything during this entire time where they were ahead in numbers. It was a 4 versus 3 on the map, and they got nothing. They got absolutely nothing. <laughs> By the way, Sildren went into the forest medicine. And now I'm coming back to what I said earlier. Think about the value that Guillotine had in this game, and now think about how this game would look if he would have gone into the other ult. It's crazy. I mean, honestly, I, I really I don't understand Guillotine with comps like this. 
They had one team fight. They, they had a bit of. It wasn't useless. Guillotine wasn't useless. But now imagine this with him having the full setup with his 10 and 20. That would be incredible. But well, here it is. The Rexa got stunned. Light bomb engaged. Fully dodged. Completely dodged. Guillotine not used just yet. And trying to get the damage out. Diablo slowly poked. These Arcanite axes are insane, by the way. Absolutely insane. The damage that he gets with that. Suljin, they're trying to follow up on him. Auto attacks woven in slowly and steadily, mainly against Urel right now. But down into the bottom of the Magenji is all of a sudden in trouble as Misha falls top lane, pressured by a cam and catapults. X strike out. Ooh, Urel! She nearly died. He nearly connected the guillotine, but he didn't. Zero value confirmed. And they're still chasing. I mean, the damage numbers, they're ramping up and they're getting more and more hits in, but it's just like nobody is dying at this point. Nobody is dying here. Oh, yeah. Spray game, absolutely on point, by the way. I like it. Even themes. Oh, my God. Like, that's an A. A for effort and execution. Those look awesome. 134,000 damage for Soldier. The troll is absolutely crushing it. And Genji, he's at 68k. 100,000 damage for Cassia, by the way. Oh, boy. They threaten boss to create space and time for this push at the top. That's a smart move, really smart move by the Dead Insiders. Threaten the boss, force them to react to it, and allow the catapults to get to the core. Once the catapults are at the core, this might even be game. But Genji dies! No, no, the tether! Sanctification, beautiful sank, but it's not enough. Rexa is dead, catapults on the core, and the core is dropping quickly. Urel is on the way back. One catapult is griefing in the back here. The core is slowly falling, but they took the boss, and I think the blue team is going to lose this now. This is insane. 70% they lost 30% on the core the fight continues Suljin has to go in full man mode right now or this is over if he dies it's GG and he goes down yeah that's game that has to be game that has to be game with the boss at the top the keep is gonna fall they're chasing everybody down right now and that's ladies is what you get when you don't pick your Taz Dingo on Suljin I have zero doubt in my mind that this would have been an absolute lock for them if they didn't meme around with the guillotine. They did, and now they get punished. Fuck around and find out. Well, they're finding out right now. 40 kills in total. Crazy persistence by Disgusting. They were so far behind, but they made it happen. Now the boss is on the core, and that is a tie in the best of five. Well done, well played, disgusting, with a lot of perseverance, and they are able to lock in the victory on Braxis Holdout, GG. Well, game number three. Uh, this could have been a 2-0 lead for Dead Insiders, but disgusting, they held on to the game. They believed in their chance to turn it, and turn it they did. So, very well played. And that leaves us now with a tie as we're heading into game three of the best of five. And we have Warhead Junction. All right. So, Warhead once again. Big map, and therefore everything that is good about globals, about Lucios, about anything that can speed you up is, of course going to be super important here as well so let's see what disgusting can do it's still insane to me that that Suljin lost I mean he was stacked out of his mind I think he had 140,000 or more damage towards the end it was absolutely bonkers so Brightwing gets immediately banned I mean again Globus in general are going to be good here Brightwing being one of them we have on top of that the push power a little bit limited with Sylvanas also banned out but yeah very interesting that they go into Suljin picks and all of the other stuff already in the earlier games so we had a couple of wild picks today and I wouldn't really mind seeing something like that here on Warhead Junction too so let's say what they can pull off Lucio gets banned I mean the that was pretty much a given. Just too strong on a big map like this. We saw it actually in action earlier when Yasu played him, just zipped around like crazy. 
So in comes the uh, Sergeant Hammer ban. I mean, that's been pretty consistent throughout the tournament. Nobody really wants to deal with Hammer, and there's obviously also just the the general meta currently in Europe where Hazu and his boys, Nick and whoever, they all brought Hammer back, and now it's on everybody's mind too. And nobody wants to deal with her. So Blaze gets picked right from the get-go as a number one pick even. Yeah, and Hoga Genji for the other team. Now, Blaze obviously is the high priority and really strong. I just a bit surprised that they actually went for him. I expected them to uh, maybe take Genji away. Limu has of course been a Genji player for like a long time and really loves to play the hero. And giving him uh, again such a mobile character here, I thought they would try to limit that a little bit. Greyman and Rhaegar, so they actually have a lot that can go for camps, just generally speaking. I would assume that they're going to ban out um, Anduin, so get rid of the cry, uh, the crybaby here. Most likely, uh, the blue team up here, sorry, the, the red team on their ban, not the other way around. Muradin, yeah, eliminating one stun, and obviously he has also the mobility here. Initially, when we came into this, I expected to see Rhaegar again, the same as we saw last time that Warhead was played. But both now have their side laners already. There's still a chance that maybe Falstead gets some attention. But yeah, yeah, Anwin bans. That is not really a big shock, so he's out. And let's see what we're gonna get for Dead Insiders. I mean, they are the ones who really have to still at the front line. We need to have a support for them. Support, you're never gonna choke anybody out there. Jojo it is. Yeah, good for interrupts of course as well. And Karazim. Are they threatening another Abatha like they did in the first game? I mean, Abatha Genji, Abatha Hogger, Abatha Karazim, all awesome. All great. And I think that's something that Disgusting is now looking as well as like, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. These guys played Abatha on Haunted Mines. Are they now going to do that again on Warhead? And I think there's a very good chance that this is actually happening. There's a lot of good head targets on the other side. Ragnaros! Yes! Okay, big map, Lava Wave, definitely viable here. So we could see Ragnaros Lava Wave again as we did previously in Division 1. And what is the final pick? Is it an Abatha? Come on, boys, give me the slug. Give me the slugger, I want the slaps. You know you want to. You know you want to pick him. Nah. The wait is over. What do you mean the wait is over? Fuck off, nobody wants you. Cassia is in. Warhead Junction. They robbed us of the Abatha pick, but it should still be a good one. Warhead, everybody. Let's go. Game number three in the best of five. That inside is against Disgusting, and it is map number three with Shizakid Kid on Johanna. Bishops on Hogger. Spin to win, baby. Anime power on Cassia. We got no game, no life on Karazim and Limu on Genji. Over on the right side of the map, Lavakal with Rega. We got Mimikyu on Diablo. Akun is on Blaze. Itrax on Greymane. And Alva Rus on Ragnarok. Okay. Uh, the other guy. What was I about to say? Like uh, Alva Rus on uh, Ragnaros. Not Ragnarok. Different things. Maybe a little bit similar, but yeah. So this time no stacking for Cassia, by the way. Instead, we are seeing her with the charge strikes and immediately, yeah, gets low, gets low. Let's go in for the vision. And Greymane nearly didn't make it. But the jet propulsion plays that we've seen in the last game are now being executed by Disgusting, or at least they're trying to. So off we go. The interesting part is also that if you properly play that out with the uh, last wave, you can get some really nice stuns connected there. But Ragnaros is already down, so that's a quick kill there. And uh, a bit unfortunate. I mean, Tim would probably be hyped that there's some lava wave potential. It's a massive map. The bigger the map, the more potential you have to see lava wave. Normally, in any other situation, it's always sulfurous. And even here, you have a Diablo setup and also a jet propulsion that you can use by Blaze to set up a sulfurous smash if you're trying to go for the kill here. So that's one of the most important things. But we'll see what they are going to do. Do they want to play macro? Do they want to play more around the team fight? Definitely both possible here. Depending how you want to play your cards. 
The cool thing for the blue team is obviously that, well not like this, but if you're playing your cards right with Hogga, then you can also easily take these camps down and they are quite impactful as well, so you have to try and see if you can push the lanes out a bit more aggressively. Vision, super important too, and both of the teams are going to be fighting for that. We now have another camp taken over on the left side. It's currently Cassia who's taking care of it. But the doggy duo over here, uh, they are probably the best roaming duo that we have right now to take these camps. I mean, yes, Hoga is going to give them a run for the money, but Rega and Greyman in tandem can easily take all of these apart without a problem at all. So down at the bottom of the map, baby Ragnaros is still styling it up. And this is really where level 10 is going to be the most interesting. That, on the other hand, is awesome. They're diving in aggressively, take Rhaegar down, try and steal the camp away. Ragnaros isn't here, neither is Cassia, but she at least is on the way. Seems like Greyman is not going to make it. I suppose that Karazim is also going to... No, he actually is able to survive through this. They stole the camp, they got the kills, and Genji just ended. <laughs> But he got the kill. <laughs> All right, that's worth it. Libu is sometimes such a typical Genji player. It's amazing. If he if he smells a kill, he's going for it. If he dies, he doesn't give a shit. It's just like, yeah, I don't care. I don't care. Did I get the kill? Yeah, so it's all good. So he came in, got the kill, four kills to one. And they can now use all of those camps that they just got to get even more damage connected. Up at the top, for example, the wall is already being destroyed. We're having uh, down at the bottom of the map, Hogger still playing against Ragnaros. Experience lead. I mean, it's the level that we're talking about, so this really helped. These little aggressive moves is always what's happening when you have these Russian-Ukrainian teams play out. It's, it's, it's awesome. But Galdor, it's not a problem. We go team fight, we kill everybody, and then it's easy. Is like no problem at all. And you die, you drink vodka, you try again. And at some point you kill, you win. Always loved it. From beta onwards, the Russian and Ukraine, all the Eastern European teams, honestly, were always aggressive as hell. And sometimes it might not be the most successful, might be a little bit over the top, but these boys are always such a joy to watch because they don't shy away from an engage, from a fight, come in and try and take him down. It started with the blood for blood comms that we had with Chef Kaja and all of these boys, and now you see it here as well. Invade the camp, yeah, fuck it, let's go. That's exactly what they did here. Now we got four kills to two. We have level seven versus seven, and the party is starting. Full spec into, at least for now, into the blast wave here, also with a slow burn, the blistering attacks now on level seven. But with level 10, we're going to see what kind of direction they want to take it from a strategy perspective. Still the lead in experience. Greyman jumping in out. Has to be careful also about the blinds a little bit. I can quickly render him fairly useless whenever he engages in these fights. And hello, Diablo! Somebody's in trouble, so he's down. And that is another forehead that they have now in a second. Yeah, well, maybe not. He can't be there too long. Yeah, getting eaten by the condemned there definitely did not help his cause. So, yeah, they get another warhead and they get another kill. Damn. Yeah, now they're crushing it. Seven kills to two. Somebody got angry on the last game, didn't they? I mean, damn. They were really looking at this and saying, like, all right, boys, this is not a thing. Like, how could we lose that game? They're coming back with a vengeance here. Hogga though gets killed, couldn't even use the warhead. Down at the bottom of the map, they don't even have to use it. And Limo, okay, he gets out. Limo gets out, but down at the bottom of the map, they're focusing their attention on Diablo again, and he's just sitting right there as the seven-sided strike kicks in. Karazim goes full pirate with an Arrrr, and then drops him right there. So the next thing that happens is that Ragnaros dies too. So there's a lot of dying going on on the red team side, and I mean specifically with the level 10 abilities for them, that's pretty, I mean, it's kind of kept obvious. Oh, <laughs> Limo is cutting it really close. I mean, he really does. He goes to the edge with his plays. There's still a warhead up on the map and they're still holding one, so they can always interrupt that. And this is half a level until level 10, so they should be able to lock this one in if they rotate anybody else over too, which they're currently doing. So, yep. There's a kid on the side though. He's also waiting. Oh! <laughs> that was a cool play. It didn't work, but that was a cool idea. I like that. I really, really like that. 
waiting here, vision granted, and trying to go for seven sided and the blessed shield. Bit high risk, high reward, but that was very, very cool to try. Now, it is indeed Lava Wave, so Lava Wave can now give them a little bit of control over the macro in this game. Level 10 is finally there for the boys in red. But of course, there's a lot of problems for them. They lost the bottom four, they're losing some ground in the middle, they're still behind in experience. Hogger is now starting to steal some of their camps away too. And in kills, they are also trailing behind. They are a bit of a slow starting team, we've seen that on the second map, but can they really turn this to you? That's the question. Starting to stun, I like it. Very nicely played against Genji. He is able to move out of the fight though, so not really a problem yet. Blaze at the front once again, and nice moves by Cassia too. That's good damage against the red team that she gets out here. The shockwave and the seven-sided, that could be coordinated a bit better, but they get the kill on Rhaegar before the dog can self-ancestral. And now look at Genji, slices, dices, jumps in for one kill after another. They're getting a double, they're getting a triple! And Ragnaros is too little too late. <laughs> yeah, but that's kind of funny. <laughs> you tried, bro, you tried. Uh, kind of caught on the wrong side of the of the gate there for just a second. But yeah, so Ragnaros is the only survivor in that battle. 13 kills to 4 now. We have a talent advantage for the dead insiders. And now also another warhead just hitting home. Taking the tower down, bit of damage on the fort with the next warheads up on the map. So things are currently looking very good once again for the dead insiders. And I'm pretty sure that they are not going to yeah overplay their cards this time I, well i mean they're always aggressive right but i think if they have the lead they are not going to just they're going to take it serious they're not just going to sit there and get complacent at least i would hope so because currently they're dominating but their insiders they well they ran into the same situation on the last map and the tenacity of disgusting was a big problem for them so Shizak Kid is coming in once again here, trying to make a little bit of a play. The rest of the team is there too. Ragnaros up at the top, still with the blast wave for the level 13. Yeah, they're trying with a seven sider to get a Diablo kill, and they do before the incest relates, and that's not the only one that they can take down. Blaze dies as well. So that's a double kill, and that fort should fall. Well done and coordinated. And Ragnaros, uh, I mean, again, he would love to save this. Coming in again, but he can't use the trade there. Genji, yeah, wanted to get a kill. Doesn't get out. This time it didn't work. He loves his aggressive plays. When they work out, it looks awesome. And when they don't, then it looks a little bit silly. But they got the fort. They got the fort. They're 10 kills ahead. They are heavily ahead in experience. They have topside now. An easy defense with Hogger. There's another warhead at the bottom of the map that they can also get, and they're already on it. So they are in a much better position around the objective. Now, first of all, you have to use them, of course, and not lose them to the opponent, but still. So the Lava Wave is coming in. We're going to get that with, I mean... I guess we're going to get another minion wave potentially right over here. So if he timed that properly, might even get another hit. And yes, he does. So this is the maximum that you get. If you're going for a lava wave play, you always have to properly time it for the map so that you just get the, the spawning minion wave. That's exactly what he did. Seven-sided strike and he gets out. No game, no life. He was the one that got caught and then he gets out, uses the seven-sided first. But we still have a kill against Cassia. The problem is that Rhaegar also died, and that's the support gone. Karazim, by the way, going straight for the additional aggression as he goes for the way of 100 fists and dies trying to get a kill on Greymane. I mean, they really want these kills. And they get some of them, at least. So they're taking down Diablo, and also... I mean, it's going to be a matter of time, but they're going to get Ragnaros for sure. So Ragnaros is dead too. Karazim dying was a bit unfortunate, since with the support, they would have had the extra sustain to help them through the upcoming fights, and they could maybe capitalize on these kills a bit more. But as it stands, they are 12 kills ahead, which is ridiculous. 12 kill lead... And, well, the warhead is down and Jojo gets away. Alright, good damage. Wall destroyed. Minion wave nearly taken down. Jojo might not make it. Well, now that... Yeah, she's dead. So went a little bit too deep. And Limu, he can't die too. If he dies now as well, okay, he's able to get... Well, is he able to get away? Yes. 
If that would have been a cocktail kill, that would have been kind of funny. The keep, by the way. Catapult on the keep, that's never a good thing. And at the top, we have, again, bishops pushing with Hogger. But the fights continue. I mean, this entire game was just an endless battle. Somewhere on the map, there was always a fight going on. And keep in mind that Genji actually has a warhead. So, needs to be careful with that. They're trying to go in again for Greymin, and they take him down. Lava Wave at the bottom of the map now. Self Ancestral is through. Blaze is dead. And especially Karazi with a way of 100 fists is now getting a lot more single target damage in than previously and can really help them to take some of these guys down. It survives again, by the way. Now, Rega wants the kill, but he doesn't even get that. So, Karazim gets out. Absolutely ruthless the way that he's playing this. He's currently sitting at 29,000 damage, by the way. Not bad for support. Jojo is sitting at 30k. Rega has 12,000, just as a, as a counter example. Ragnaros saving the bottom key, but you can definitely tell they're grasping. I mean, they're grasping for straws here. They're really reaching, attempting to survive somehow so that they can later make a comeback happen like they did on the second map. Karazim at the top pushing this out still. They're half a level away from level 20. They steal some of the camps away from the opponent's team. Kasia has easy top damage in the game with a 24,000 lead over Greymane who's sitting at 40,000. Keeps have so far not fallen yet but it's only a matter of time at the pace we are going here. I mean, this is getting bit crazy. Bot lane in particular is a huge issue. But even in the mid lane, I mean, that fort has been destroyed too, and catapults as the game continues are now becoming more and more dangerous. But, they want to definitely nuke the shit out of the bottom keep. Yep, there they are, and they're just like, let's nuke it, baby. Both of them come in, and... <laughs> that one's dead. That one's down, talking about dead. I guess one of those two is at least gonna fall. And maybe both. No game, no life with the first instinct to immediately jump in. Now he has quite some ability here. Jumps in, jumps out, tries to evade, tries to walk back, and at that point Bishop's just said, yeah, fuck it, you're dead. <laughs> and then goes in there again. <laughs> oh, never change. But this is how they lost the last game. Keep that in mind. Like, they went for really aggressive moves individually and then completely lost any team cohesion that they previously had and then started totally feeding and it was just one hit after another. And again, it happens fucking again. Bishops, the hell are you doing? Bishops going in and just feeding into the opponent for another staggered death. Now, they are buying a little bit of time for this down here too. But this is just not going to be enough. I mean, if Genji was trying to get a bit of damage in, Ragnaros is easily destroying that. Another minion wave that gets taken down. So they're buying time for the bot lane, which can easily recover now. And it's just insane. Like, why are you doing this again? It's the same shit that happened in game number two. You're heavily ahead. You're starting to meme around a little bit. You want to go for some highlight reel or whatever. And now you have a boss knocking at your top door. All of a sudden, the red team has level 20. They were murdered the entire game, and it's another potential comeback. Guys, what the fuck? This is a keep that's gone within seconds, and that boss is strong and still healthy. Hogger isn't even here. They're desperately trying to defend it. Look at Ragnaros. He's like, oh, don't mind me. I'm going to take this one. Comes in with his trade, and that could well be game. Every time the early game, they get murdered and then Disgusting just turns it on them and drops them. Dead Insiders, I mean, talk about a throw. Holy shit. Core is low and Core is gone. Goodbye, baby. A 2-1 lead for Disgusting. That was a Disgusting throw for sure. What on earth are we watching? Okay, so we are definitely looking at a game of throws here. What? Like, what? Dead Insiders, I really don't get it. Like, these guys are ruffle stomping the opponent half the game. Then uh, they get a little bit greedy. They lose a hero or two. But everything is still fine. Everything is absolutely all right. There's not a problem at all. You just have to wait for the remaining heroes to come back and you're going to be in a good spot. What do they do instead? They just individually YOLO into the opponent, 
stagger deaths and all of a sudden there's plenty of time for disgusting to not only get to level 20 draw even in talents but also get a good push going and then they win the game it happened in game number two it happened in game number three and now we are in game number four and i honestly don't know what's going on here like these guys are crazy i mean absolutely crazy they were it, I had the impression in game number three that they were absolutely mad after the second game. But here now, we have game number four coming up on Hanamura. <laughs> and there's a chance for Disgusting to yeah, move on to the winner bracket final. This is the winner bracket semifinal, so whoever loses here is not out of the tournament and just drops down into the loser's bracket. But boy, oh boy. Tracer, Band, and so is Sylvanas. I mean, with the Tracer, Band, they're already targeting, uh, targeting Limu a little bit. Are we going to get another Genji? Is that going to be a thing? Surely not, right? I mean, they know that they want him. I, if they give Genji to him, then they're just like, yeah, whatever, dude. Like, you're Genji. Uh, we don't care. He did a fair amount of damage. I mean, he also overstepped at times and played it too greedily and died for it. But he usually got a counter kill at least. So, first pick on Hanamura, what's it going to be? What are they going to go for? They go for Brightwing. I mean, Brightwing helps with the Genji control as well. But I am just... Honestly, I'm just like flabbergasted about what we've seen so far. It's just crazy. It's absolutely bananas. <laughs> I can't believe that Disgusting has a 2-1 lead. Good for them. I mean, again, good for them. They're not giving up, they're playing this through, they get just completely butchered in the early game, and then they're like, okay boys, we're gonna shine later. And they did, two times in a row, and at the end of the day, nobody cares how you won a game. It's all about, did you at the end of the day win it, yes or no? So here comes Limu again with Genji for the third time in a row. They drop Malfurion very early as their support. And now, let's see what the plan is. What is the big strategy here for Hanamura to make sure that you're at least forcing the fifth map out of this one? Yurel is in, so is Cassia. And... <laughs> I mean, it's, it's very amusing and entertaining. Uh, but yeah, again guys, if you want to support events like this and you're watching this on YouTube, you can check out the Patreon link in the YouTube description. I'm going to be absolutely honest with you, I suck when it comes to updating people on Patreon, what I'm doing right now and all of this, I'm really horrible at it. Telling people like, hey, I'm working on this right now, I'm working on that right now. I'm total trash. I'm trying to get better at it and I'm trying to remind myself to write updates. But if you look at the post history on Patreon, you pretty much already noticed that this is usually resulting in me just forgetting about it again. At the end of the day, I think by now uh, I've proven over the last like 15, 20 years <laughs> that I'm good for my words. I mean, we did it with the Heroes International and the offline event where a lot of people were like, well, how do we know that you're actually going to do that? Uh, shout out, by the way, to uh, um, NLG Miami, to Kevin and his boys. But yeah, so uh, I, I think by now I should have enough trust on that end. But if you want to support events like this, if you want to see more tournaments that we are hosting ourselves here, uh, community-driven tournaments, then check out the Patreon. And, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm always working on something. I'm never just sitting there, like, uh, I'm, not, I'm not going to retire on Hawaii or something. So I'm not just running away here. <laughs> but, yeah, on the update part, when it comes to that, that stuff, it's... Uh, I'm annoying myself how bad I am at that. It's the same with, like, a lot of the social media. Like, my Instagram account is such a shit show. It's ridiculous. Like, one post every six months or something. But, well, we got our combo ready. We got Diablo plus Urel at the front line for the red team. Jaina coming in with this, too. And, yeah, Muradin Hanzo as the final pick. So the Shimada brothers are united for Hanamura Temple. Guys, let's go. Let's see if they can pull it off or not. Dead Insiders versus Disgusting. Game 4. Game number four, Dead Insiders versus Disgusting. Yeah, rumor has it that Dead Insiders, they needed a short break after the game to uh, have a physiotherapist look after their shoulder because they were throwing so hard. So uh, by now, everything has been fixed and uh, they feel much better. So we'll see what happens in game four. <laughs> She's a kid on mirror Day. We got bishops in blue playing Hoga, anime power on Hanzo, no game, no life on Malfurion, and Limu again on Genji. 
the right side of the map, Itrax on Cassia, we got Lava Carl on Brightwing, Akunas on Ural, Mimikyu with Diablo, and Jaina played by Alvaros. Five men towards the top. Guess somebody wants to gank a little bit. Look at that. Bishops, he's baiting. He's such a master baiter. That was absolutely beautiful, but he didn't do anything. Oh, uh, maybe. Yeah, she's dead. <laughs> Stormer might have missed, but it was a zoning storm. No way. <laughs> I love how they both jump over. Oh my god. That was so good. I mean, I expected it 100% to happen from Genji, but murdered immediately. Let's get her! So yeah, they're just racing at this point, but look at that beauty. So they zone her out completely, and then bam, there comes the jump, and both of them right after her. Didn't even need to go in, she was already dead. But, oh, glorious. Absolutely glorious. So yeah, they're just going for the structures here. Muradin comes down, trying to, uh, I guess, immediately pull him off and turns into a monkey. <laughs> but uh, So they take the fort down. At the top, I suppose we're going to see the same thing. If you have a trade situation like this, it just accelerates the game. It's pretty much what it does. So it just accelerates the game, makes things a little bit faster. So that's where we're at right now. And this is just in line with how the two teams play this game. Which I don't mind at all. Also means that Cassie has a single stack now. <laughs> a sad first single stack. Uh, and they're invading again. Of course they're invading again. Why would they do anything else but invade? And they're even keeping it up. They want that thing. They want the Sentinel. And they want the team fight. I don't know if that's working. Like, how can you be so aggressive? Guys, you're down a game. You're down a game. How can you just still look at this and be like, YOLO? I mean, they're coming in once more, so they're like two kills to one now in their favor. Hoga is dead. <laughs> Everybody else is low. Jaina is dead too. The fuck is happening here? Oh, Moonfire! Ah, Hanzo. Four kills to two. This is such a bloodbath. This is ridiculous. This is absolutely ridiculous. Heroes that already died at the beginning of the fight are back and are fighting again. Payload is now popping up too. What a glorious game already. This is pretty much... Ah, okay. So at least the Sentinel was taken by the red team. It's pretty much just continuing where the last games left off. That's kind of where we are. Half a level lead again for the blue team. They're ahead in kills. Hmm... Where have I seen this before? Oh yeah! <laughs> game one, two, three, <laughs> and now game four. <laughs> exactly, that, that, that's where that was. Oh boy. It's just so good. So they gotta limit the stacking a little bit, or at least gonna try and do that. Let's, let's see if they can. But it's all about that... I mean, at this point it's just all about the discipline of dead insiders. That's what it's about at the end of the day. Their discipline is the one thing that's absolutely crucial here. And so they have to play around that. Another hit. Muradin in the thick of things. And he goes down again. Yeah, Muradin gets murdered. And I think he might not be the only one. No, Urel is still fine. Okay, so she hopped back to safety. And I guess we're going to get a couple of shots there. Look at that. Payload. Here we go. Shots fired. Genji a little bit too late. And he's also a little bit too... No, he's still alive. He's not too dead. Ah, nice move though. Nice attempt. So yeah, shots are fired. Ding, ding, ding. And Hogga is just still pushing this one out. So structurally, definitely a lead now for Disgusting. This is one of the few times in the series where they've actually pulled ahead a little bit in the early game because now also in experience, they are on par with the uh, opponent. And they're all still fighting. They're all still looking for kills. Cellcracker's in level 7 only for dead insiders. There it is finally also for Disgusting. But they're not quite trying to turn it around immediately. But here's the fight. The chase is on. As it usually is. Akunis. Careful. Jumping to the back line. Stunned against Genji. The wall. But he gets out. Protected by the way. Oh, these jet propulsions. Uh, yeah, not quite blazes in here. <laughs> Stop balls. <laughs> stun is stun. So yeah, it was a really nice stun against Urel and that locked her down. 
Five kills to three. I mean, I guess that's not going to change. The kill count, at least in the early in the mid game, seems like it's always going to be in favor of dead insiders, but that doesn't really do anything for you if you can't win the game at the end of the day. I also love how they went for Broccoli here. So we got the Vengeful Roots in. They're going full Groot on this one. And uh, we'll, we'll see what they can pull off with that. The new Guardians of the Galaxy trailer is out, by the way. And I don't know, but like I was disappointed. There's a lot of people that seem to be hyped about it. There's a apparently a couple of Easter eggs and stuff in there that are kind of cool. But I watched it and I was like, eh? That did do very little for me, so I'm not so sure. Uh, right now, I feel like this is a pretty questionable one. So, yeah, not not really excited yet. And I usually, like, I love the first one. But, yeah. But, yeah, either way. So, uh, Groot is currently not really all that, that strong. So, we're going full baby Groot on this one. Only five stacks on the level one for now. So, if he wants to be uh, a little bit more beefy here and really have an impact, then he needs to step it up a bit. Camp gets taken just in time before the opponent makes a move on it. Level 10 nearly there, but not quite. The Stormball connects again, and they're dropping Diablo a bit, but Brightwing is ready, and so is Jaina to provide some cover. And yeah, the payload is spawning again, and here comes level 10. So with the rogue abilities, maybe they can get another kill. They go for Diablo. Oh, close! And that has to be a kill. No, he's still alive! Diablo is still alive, and Hanzo dies just as we are seeing Malfurion with his old attempting to save him. So they're pushing this a bit further, but thanks to the kill and all the experience that Disgusting got with it, they now also have a rogue abilities, and they're using them immediately to turning this around, and there it is. Easy double kill for Disgusting, and boy, oh boy, this might be one of the first games in the series where from the get-go Disgusting is starting to take a lead. Well, maybe not from the get-go, but definitely in the early mid-game. So now Muradin is dead as well. They're still trying to go for bishops. I have no idea why he's here all alone, but he gets polymorphed, and he's not going to make it either. So that's seven kills to five. Another camp to be taken. Urel was at the top and took the four down. And, oh boy, that is, yeah. All right, so now it's up to Dead Insiders to prove that they can also turn this uh, around. That they are not, uh, that they are a team that can also go for a comeback and not only be the team that takes the lead initially because they are trailing. They're trailing by nearly a level. They are two kills behind. And, yeah, it's, it's starting to get a bit problematic here for them. I mean, there's also the fact that Cassia, of course, as the game continues, is going to stack more and more on a level 1. And we've seen the scaling in, I think it was game number 2 in Braxis, right? Yeah, so we've seen the scaling there. Can really have a huge impact in the later stages. Time will tell. But either way, now we got the next payload being escorted in. Dead Insiders are a little bit hesitant on how they should approach this here, but they also got to be careful of the level 30 talent that eventually is going to drop for them. Irel gets a little bit poked out there. They're trying to get them in the choke point. Arrow, triple hit, shockwave, <laughs> Kazia dead. Nice. Ice block, keeping Jaina alive for another second, but not for much longer. So that opens up the team fight with two kills for the blue team. They get Hanzo out of the battle, but that arrow was money. Coming in, hitting three, stunning them out, and then immediately we got Hogger ready with a good shockwave. And that CC chain was more than enough to lock in two kills. But they're still a bit behind here. Now they have map control for now. That's going to help them with the payload a little bit. That's going to help them with additional camps. But let's see how much deeper they can go with this right now. Because at this moment in time, they're still hoping for more kills. They're trying to go for Urel, which doesn't really work out here. She is a little bit too slippery now that Brightwing is moving in. They always seem to forget about Brightwing. That happened on Braxis twice, that Brightwing just turned the fight by teleporting in. They at least get Diablo, but they're going to lose Malfury. I mean, he has no chance there. So maybe they can go for the Fruit Fly in the back. Lemo's at least trying to do that. Ah, oh, nice. Pogger coming through with another kill. They get the support, and now they're trying for more. They're losing Hanzo, but they're killing Jaina. So it's really just kill for kill for kill for kill. Lemo playing with the vision as best as he can, waiting for the cooldown, and he doesn't get it in time. <laughs> Oh, God, that sucks. He was so close. 
Yeah, ult already being used. Mirrodin is hopping away. Diablo is back to business. The fights that don't end. And here comes the hit on Irel, but she has the jump back and uh, quickly taps the fountain. It's they're never letting go. Retreat is not an option. That's not a word that they have in the vocabulary. It's insane. Ret Counter, I don't understand. What is this retreat? Can you explain? Like, ask the French. 11 kills to 10. We got also Muradin, by the way, with the Haymaker. I mean, you've seen it already, but just in case somebody has not paid attention to the entire game. Akun is low, but the fight is still continuing. This fight has been going on for minutes at this point. So uh, here comes Akunis. This time it's Genji who finishes the deal. And he gets a second kill. Nice. One after another. 13 to 10. And they've taken the lead once more. Can they get the structures here though? Brawl, brawl, brawl. One hit after another. Big shockwave. Big shockwave. And the kills keep coming. Yep, looking good over here. So they're still trying to push it down at the bottom of the map. And yeah, just look at that last fight and how it turned out towards the end. They're diving underneath the fort in an attempt to get more kills. And then they're dropping Brightwing and Diablo. They were able to take Cassia down here as well as they're breaking through the wall at the bottom of the map. It's just insanity. Absolute insanity. At some point they just decided to not give a shit about the payload anymore and instead of just going for one hit after another. Look at this! Jaina comes back and dies again. Veni, Vidi, BG. Drops right away. One and a half level lead right now. It's only a matter of seconds before Dead Insiders are throwing the game again. Or not. This time they hit another Stormball on Irel, and uh, she's dead too. <laughs> oh, we have Tranquility back, you know what that means? They can stay longer. Let's go core boys. Of course they're not going back. Why would you go back? Why would they go back? No, there's more shit to kill. So they come in and they're trying to kill more of it. They're going for the core. 12 minutes in, they don't care. Death timer's not high enough. Who cares? They don't. Another kill, another kill. Wer hat noch nicht, wer will normal. They kill Jaina for the upper times. We have Muradin finally down. The core is also slowly starting to fall. Hogger is pogging at the Nexus over here. Core at 83. Genji coming in with another hit. And I guess finally they're retreating. I mean, who am I kidding? Of course they're not retreating. They're baiting the ult out from Ural and then they're turning it on her. And they're killing her again. <laughs> 70% on the core. Still poking. Yeah, they delayed this another 20 30 seconds and Muradin is back to business. But so is Ural and Jaina, so they gotta be ke careful. Yeah. yeah Malfurion! They are running out of mana. This is the biggest problem right now. They're running out of mana. This is the biggest issue. It's fucking crazy. <laughs> the only way to stop Bishop. <laughs> like, what are you doing? No! No! Not like this! No! Oh, 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 oh. Don't do this to me again! What the fuck? Oh, look at it! Hoga dies, and then here, co here he comes. I got this! No, you don't. <laughs> Oh, 64% on the core. Now they're gonna lose it, of course. <laughs> oh boy. I mean, even if he kills her, they're still gonna lose this one. So yeah, shots are being fired. Payload has been delivered. Again, bot lane, there is gonna be some pressure. They got the Sentinel, they got the double catapult. This will be defeated. But now that we're having Dead Insiders back up on the map, they got their mana pool full. <laughs> yeah, of course. He had no vision. <laughs> I, 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 I could swear that he had no vision of the camp. He just jumped. <laughs> That's what you do. They really need to rename this, uh, their team. It's like, this is Team YOLO. 22 stacks, by the way, in Malfurion right now. So uh, he's starting to get into bro uh, broccoli territory at least a little bit. But this is just a delight. These guys are always, are always fun to watch. I mean, win or lose, but they are entertaining. You gotta give them that. These Valkyries, by the way, have done nothing this game. Absolutely nothing. So, yeah, this one gets snuck in. 
Malfurion is sitting at 30,000 damage. Mm, he's not too shabby. He's more than Muradin has. With Haymaker. So, if we want to get Muradin... Uh, sorry, Malfurion a couple more hits. Then a couple more stacks. And maybe at some point, you know, he's going to turn around completely. Look at Jaina, by the way. She died six times. Five kills against Urel. And five kills against Cassia. So yeah, camp after camp, they're just going for it and they wait for level 20. I just expect them at some point to go for the core. Now one of the things that triggered the entire barrage of attacks was obviously that they were always a little bit ahead in uh, the numbers. So they always had like a 4 versus 3, a 5 versus 4. But right now, they are definitely looking for something to... Look at this. They gave the entire map up. They're waiting for level 20. They're just like, guys, we need to play this safe and slow. So they gave the map up. <laughs> yeah, of course they're all sitting here. <laughs> oh, disgusting with the perfect strategy. It's like, guys, let's just wait and let them kill themselves. It's like, great idea. And of course it's working. <laughs> ah, it's nearly working. Muradin is dead. I mean, it's literally the strategy of disgusting. Like, guys, what if we just sit in base and wait until they int? <laughs> this is literally the winning strategy of disgusting. <laughs> it's like, why don't we just sit on our side of the map, right at the core, and then we wait for them to end? It's like, nah, that's never gonna work. I mean, they would never do that. Like, why would they do that? It's like, yeah, just you wait. IQ to 100 plays, right there. Yeah, now where are we? The Sentinel is gonna get snuck. <laughs> they have level 20 talents themselves. And it's just so damn good. <laughs> I am thoroughly convinced right now that Dead Inside has made a deal at the beginning of the game where they said, All right, guys, every death you have to drink one shot of vodka. It explains everything. Just think about it for a moment. If that's a thing, it explains everything that has happened today. Think about the series. Think about how it progressed. And tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> 21 to 15, here we go, they're trying to go for the core. This, you gotta be shitting me, it's happening again. This cannot be real. I refuse to believe that this is real. GG, a 3-1 victory for Disgusting against Dead Insiders. I don't know what's happening here. Thank you everybody for watching the video today. I hope that you enjoyed the show and the commentary. And keep in mind that the spoiler protection that is going to run for the rest of the video is made possible by all the support on Patreon.com. So guys, if you want to support my work, if you want to help me start new projects and keep the spoiler protection in place, please consider heading over to Patreon.com slash Kaldor. There's also a link in the YouTube description and check that out. Thanks in advance and see you guys next time with more esports coverage here on Color TV. Have a great day.